we're just gonna go for it you know we're just gonna do it three two one we're doing it live happy new year and also happy 337 subscribers at the time i'm filming this i got a kazoo for christmas actually i got six fear me so it may be well past Christmas, but that does not mean I'm done talking about Christmas movies. I would have liked to publish this video a bit closer to Christmas, but I got mono just before the holiday and it has completely sapped my work ethic. So here we are in January. Today I want to walk you through the most insane Christmas movie I have ever seen because the world needs to know about this and I cannot carry this burden alone. This whole thing started at least six years ago when my family decided we were going to watch one of the extra movies on our Rankin Bass DVD set and who oh boy was it atrocious. So much so that I'm pretty sure we turned it off before we even got halfway through. But this year, dear viewer, I decided to give it another go. This cursed movie is called Cricket on the Hearth. It was made in 1967 and I shit you not, it is based on a real book by Charles Dickens. That may seem kind of mundane, but when you hear what happens, it's gonna get a lot weirder. But enough expositing, let's dive in. Well, actually the movie doesn't even start right away because we're forced to sit through this man, Danny Thomas, introducing the movie because he plays one of the main characters and I guess that was just a thing they did in the 60s. For some reason, he also pretends he's never heard of the movie that he's clearly already done the voice work for. Cricket on the Hearth. Matter of fact, I just found out about it myself. We then have the opening theme, shockingly called Cricket on the Hearth. Cricket on the Hearth, take that horseshoe off your door. And originally, when I was writing the notes and I was watching this the second time through, I said that this was the only tune I could even faintly remember past the second it was finished. Uh, but God, God has, has cursed, cursed me for, for my hubris. hubris, and now I can't get any of them out of my head. <laughs> Anyway, we have the song, and then we have even more introduction in the form of our narrator, who is a decrepit old man, but also a cricket. Like, I get it's a cartoon and it translates that he's old and it's been a long time since the story happened, but why does he have to look like that? Also, he winks and it's very creepy. Oh, and it's a lucky household what has a cricket on their hearth, and indeed I am good luck. Then. We finally get into our story. Our grillon du jour is named Cricket Crockett because of course he is, and he is in search of a new home, which he finds almost immediately in the form of a toy factory. He does his funky little strut over there and conveniently catches the man who runs the factory as he's leaving. His name is Caleb Plummer. He's played by Danny Thomas, and he immediately takes a liking to Cricket. Why, I've heard that you crickets bring good luck with you. How about staying with us for a while? Throughout this movie, everyone insists that crickets, especially one on your hearth, bring you good luck. Um, but I would venture that nothing good happens in this movie until the very end. So whatever luck our cricket is meant to be bringing, he's doing a very bad job. So now Cricket enters the house, sees a real sexy hearth. <laughs> And immediately drama starts going down because we're introduced to Caleb's daughter Bertha and her Prince Charming knockoff named Edward. Not to be confused with the sparkly vampire. Somehow this one is even more two-dimensional. Oh, why must you go away? I must serve out my enlistment. I must go to sea tomorrow. For two years? It's just not fair. Bertha's sad because Edward has to go and join the Royal Navy for two years and Side note, this movie definitely takes place in England, but for some reason, three of the main characters are fully American. Also, other than the accents, the thing that probably sticks out most about Bertha is her giant ass. I know that old timey dresses used to have like a poof in the back, uh, but I don't think that's it. I think she just has the biggest butt in the entire world. What does this have to do with the plot? Nothing, but it's so distracting and I need to talk about it because it was a conscious choice made on the part of several people. Before we can get any real character development from Edward, he just immediately starts singing to Bertha. Oh, Edward, I love you so. Don't give your love away. Wait for me, I will come back to you. I feel like I got a whiplash. Songs are just coming out of nowhere. Also, for someone who's about to shit all over this movie, I do like this song. The guy who plays Edward has a nice voice. The movie's got that going for it. And nothing else. Now we jump forward in time and Cricket works for with the plumbers because I guess 
crickets can do that. More red paint, Crockett, if you please. Hmm. Make it smiling red. Smiling red you want, smiling red you get. Bertha says some nonsense about painting and smiles. I suppose I'm being extravagant with the paint. But no child wants a doll who can't smile. And then she cries because... It's been a year and a half since Edward went away. And, uh, let me just check something real quick. Yeah, he's dead. Now we get another song about how... Smiles with tears. Even though it doesn't make sense because Bertha was crying because she missed Edward. I, I don't know. None of these songs serves a purpose. I think Rankin Bass just needed it to be a musical. There's some creepy dolls. Then the song ends and Bertha says this. Now for the eyes. Brown or black or sky blue pink. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's funny because sky blue pink is the color that the sky sometimes takes at sunrise and sunset blue in places and pink in places. Regardless, this laugh fest is interrupted because this man, who looks like if spinach were a person, bursts into the house unannounced with some news that no one could have seen coming. I am sorry, but it is my melancholy duty to inform you that a certain Edward Beltham, late of Her Majesty's Royal Navy, is lost at sea. Oh, no. No, no. My poor baby. No, no, my poor baby, no. Also, I don't understand how being lost at sea translates to automatically dead. Like, this was before radar, so essentially once the ship disappears over the horizon, no one knows where they are. So why is it that they automatically assume he's dead? Is this just because I didn't live back then when there were ships? I don't know. Anyway, I digress because it's here that we reach our first of several complete what the fuck moments because we learn that. The shock of that awful message delivered the way it was turned poor Bertha blind. What? So hearing that her fiance is lost at sea and maybe dead, but delivered in a way that wasn't very nice just caused so much mental anguish that she went blind? I looked it up and apparently stress can lead to vision loss, but like, really? Really? So now their lives are completely ruined. Caleb misses the deadline for Christmas, so they don't make any money. All the money they do have goes into doctors for Bertha, but no one can cure her. Caleb takes out more and more loans, but he can't pay them off, so they lose their house and are living on the street. You know, typical Christmas movie for kids stuff. Now it'd probably be a good time for Cricket to start bringing some luck, right? I mean, I guess you could argue that he does a little bit because he's yelling at Caleb from his hat and then he turns and sees that there's a toy factory there, but it was right in front of them, so they could have done it without him. Now we get to meet the most archetypal villain that I've ever seen, the owner of the toy shop, Mr. Tackleton. He's overweight, he's ugly, he's got an evil pet bird sidekick, and his only motivation is money. Quintessential baddie. Tackleton reluctantly lets Caleb work for him, but he's not gonna pay him, and his only reward will be getting to live in the factory and eating his food scraps. The weirdest part about this for me is that Tackleton says that Caleb will be working entirely on his own. Where are the other toy makers? <laughs> Did you hear that, Uriah Kaur? He wants to know where the other toy makers are. <laughs> There are no other toy makers. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have a few qualms with his business model. Like, how has he been making toys to the point where he can call himself a toy factory? Like, has he been making them all on his own and now he's just decided to stop? How has he made any money if Caleb is the only toy maker on his payroll that's not even a payroll and he's only just hired him? It's goddamn movie logic. Instead of telling Bertha the truth about their situation, I guess so she doesn't have to endure any more hardship. Caleb just lies about every single detail. Is this our new home, Father? What's it like? Well, uh, splendid. Splendid. Quite palatial. And Mr. Tackleton, what's he like, Father? Oh, he's fine. 
And he's made me head man of his entire factory. Also because the movie needs to keep reminding you that Bertha is blind, Caleb sings a song to her about how she'll see the world through my eyes. And everything will be splendid and full of color. Which kind of just seems like a smack in the face to me. Like, she still can't see things, so at this point you're just lying to a blind girl about the life she's living. This seems like great parenting to me. Cook? Oh, I can't call you Cook. What's your name? Becky? You're a very quiet girl, Becky. And you are Jarvis, are you not? Yes, my lord. Well, that'll be all, Jarvis. You can have the night off. Thank you, my lord. So Caleb has officially lost it. There's also a useless scene slash side plot where Cricket is accosted by Mr. Tackleton's crow. They get into a fight because Uriah calls him a bug and Cricket insists he's an insect. I don't have the entomological knowledge or motivation to fact check that. All I know is that Google says that bugs are insects. <laughs> Anyway, this turns into the shortest chase scene in movie history because as soon as it starts, Mr. Tackleton comes in and makes Uriah go to bed like a good little baby bird boy. The next day, Tackleton is giving Caleb shit about putting too much paint on the dolls' faces because he's a movie villain who only cares about money. Just trying to give them nice smiles. Who the blazes cares about smiles? A dot and a half is enough for any doll. Paint costs money! How original. Also, this was written by Dickens, the same guy who wrote A Christmas Carol and practically invented the whole Scrooge and Miser character type. So I'm guessing he just wanted to ride his own coattails on this one. Also, to save you the fact-checking Google search, this book came out in 1845 and A Christmas Carol came out in 1843. So Tackle Scrooge tells Caleb to stop putting so much paint on the faces and he agrees in the moment, but then at night, he and Cricket sneak back into the workshop and paint more paint on the doll's faces because they're the protagonists and I guess that's good and the toys are better? Cricket says they put the dolls right back in the box so Tackleton won't notice, but isn't there just a chance that he'll see that the dolls have more paint on? Or he'll know that Caleb's using more paint? Overall, it doesn't seem like an airtight plan to me, and I don't know if I would have done the same in his shoes, especially given that his only pay is getting to live on the premises. It's now two days before Christmas, and Caleb is out when he runs into a mysterious stranger. Oh, excuse me, sir. I had so much on my arms that I couldn't see. No, no, it was my fault, I assure you. Edward's alive! The first, or I guess second time I was watching this, I thought that Edward had just aged and he looked like that now, which didn't make sense because Caleb and Bertha didn't age. But no, he's just wearing a shitty old man costume for no reason. Well, there's a reason that comes later. It's still dumb. Naturally, Caleb invites this random old stranger into his house that it isn't his house to stay for an indefinite amount of time. And no one knows it's him. It also probably helps that they never ask him his name. It seems kind of odd to me to invite a stranger off the street to live with you, regardless of whether they're your daughter's fiance secretly in disguise, without at least knowing who they are. Bertha actually thinks she recognizes his voice. Bertha. <gasps> Uh, what is it? Oh, the, the way you said my name just now. It, it, I'm sorry. And this would be a perfect opportunity to reveal to your fiancé that you're not dead. But Edward chooses to squander that chance and Caleb starts singing about Christmas. He's seriously doubling down on the whole lying to Bertha about every single detail of their life thing because he doesn't say no to her when she says that they're gonna have all these luxuries at Christmas. What's even weirder about that though, is the song he sings is all about how it can still be Christmas if you don't have all the fancy things like a tree or a fireplace or presents. No fireplace, no Christmas tree, no decorations, just you and me. It can be Christmas why lie to Bertha about it? If it's still Christmas, why do you have to fabricate all the details? I just thought you needed to hear that. Also, Edward is going to really regret not telling Bertha the truth about his identity because the next day, Christmas Eve, Tackleton pays a visit to the workshop. 
he gives Caleb four whole shillings, which is about ten pounds in today's money. You're welcome. And also... A shilling for you, girl. Then he does something that I actually didn't see coming. He asks Bertha to marry him. This is a lonely old place for me, and I finally decided that what I need is a wife. I'm happy to inform you that I've decided that the girl I would most like to so honor is none other than your own dear, lucky Bertha. They have never interacted as far as I know, and yet Tackleton seems to think they're destined for each other and they're going to get married tomorrow. On a holiday, of course, so they don't lose a day of work. Typical Tackleton. What's even weirder, though, is that Bertha is absolutely ecstatic about this whole thing. Oh, Father, I'm, I'm so very honored. F*** Edward, I guess. I mean, I know you think he's dead, but he's literally living with you, and you maybe even thought it was him last night. But no, some rando comes along and you're instantly smitten. Here, Bertha sings another song to Caleb about how she's not a little girl anymore complete with pure grade fever dream trash of her and Edward. Carousels and wishing well, golden shoes with silver bells, starry eyes and cherry pies, that was yesterday. This is the worst song out of all of them. I have decided. And hey look, Edward's back, and he and Bertha both have news for each other, and Bertha insists she goes first. For it is bursting inside of me. <laughs> Ugh. It's fine, it's just water. Of course, Bertha tells Edward that she's going to marry Mr. Tackleton, whom she describes as the most wonderful man in the whole world. And I know she can't see him, so she can't tell that he's been intentionally drawn to look gross. But she knows nothing about him other than he's her dad's boss. Now I bet Caleb feels pretty bad about lying to Bertha about Mr. Tackleton being a bad person. Now he's going to have to deal with this man as a son-in-law. Anyway, here's Edward walking out of the house backwards. Look at him go. Excuse me. Cricket seems to be the most upset about this whole marriage situation, so he takes it upon himself to sabotage the meeting between Bertha and Tackleton later that day. Suddenly, he has a couple of small animal friends who help him to pull pranks on the guy. They drop nuts in his tea and throw pepper in his face. Real creative stuff. Tackleton's having none of it, though. Somehow, he knows that Cricket was behind it. And so he gives Uriah orders to kill him. It was that cricket made a fool of me. Uriah, get rid of him once and for all. <coughs> and this time, no slip-ups. Get professional help so you won't bungle the job. At this point, I think either Charles Dickens or the screenwriter just forgot that Tackleton was the one who foiled Uriah's last murder attempt because there was no slip up and Tackleton was the one who stopped him. But now Uriah needs professional help. So where does he go? To the sewers, of course, for the weirdest fucking scene in this entire movie. <laughs> accomplices have to be watching this nonsense so whose idea was it for the cat to be so sexy was it charles dickens did he make the cat sexy i would say this is where the movie lost me but it lost me back when bertha went blind this movie is insane cat sexiness aside never thought i'd say those words uriah meets up with his two pals and I forget their names, so we're just calling them Fancy Hat Monkey and Neurodivergent Dog, because it was the 60s and I guess this movie wasn't complete without some good old-fashioned ableism. Uh, a cricket! <laughs> so Fancy Hat Monkey suggests that they kidnap Cricket and sell him to a sea captain who's going to then resell him in China as a good luck totem. Again, seems like Cricket has done 
Gaul in terms of luck in this movie, but sure, airtight plan. They actually kidnap him without a hitch, and then they bring him aboard the captain's boat, and then... Now, where's our pay? I've got your payoff right here. proceed despite this utter buffoonery let's continue so cricket is bound up in a little cage on the boat of a captain who gleefully shoots talking animals right in their heads what is a cricket to do well fake his death he just uh closes his eyes and flops over and that's enough to fool the captain who just jettisons him out the window into the sea and then there's this confusing chain of events. Yeah, I only overlooked one thing. Crickets can't swim. Uh, yeah, but luck was with me. For another thing I forgot was crickets float. So he can't swim, so he sinks, but then he can float. So he floats up into the air and also removes his restraints, which makes me question why he didn't do that before. And then an entire Tennessee Williams, the glass menagerie of animals escorts him back to the shore. Everything is fine and back to normal. Oh, except that Bertha has a wedding dress made already somehow. Things then take another sharp right turn into weirdness land when the clock strikes midnight. Midnight on Christmas Eve. The one hour in the year when magical things is supposed to happen. Magical things are supposed to happen, and they do, because all of the toys in the workshop come to life. Climbing! The toys! It's coming to life! Oh no. Oh no. Um, ignoring that, I guess. The toys say that they can't be seen by humans, but. Crickets don't count. Why? I don't know. Nothing makes sense. The world is meaningless. There's also a very scary baby doll who's obsessed with Cricket for some reason. Blimey, no! I'm losing my mind. Anyway, they all hatch a plan to stop Bertha from getting married to Tackleton. And what is this plan, you may be asking? Well, they all climb out of the window and take off the old man's disguise to reveal that he was Edward all along, except we already knew that. Cricket is shocked, but thankfully, all the toys know what happened to Edward. Edward Belton didn't drown when his ship went down. He built himself a raft and sailed to a beautiful uncharted island. And he was there. Oh, please, sir. And he was there two years before a whaler found him and brought him back to England. How? This is a surprise to literally everyone except the toys, and I get that they're magical and whatnot, but how did they know what happened to Edward? Does the magic of Christmas somehow bestow omnipotence on inanimate objects? Also, apparently an hour has passed in two minutes because the clock conveniently strikes one and all the toys scurry away before they can explain why the fuck Edward was dressed as an old man. Cricket wakes Edward and demands to know what's what, and I'm kind of just realizing now, Edward never interacted with Cricket before he left, and I also don't think he ever saw him while he was dressed up as the old man. So why is he not insanely confused as to who this talking Cricket is and how he knows him? Did Bertha or Caleb just say to him, ah! Strange, nameless old man, welcome to our house that's not our house because we live in someone else's toy factory. Also, we have a talking cricket named Cricket Crockett who lives with us. Enjoy your stay! Regardless of that, Edward's logic as to why he dressed up as the old man is 
very confusing and not in a, well, that was a weird choice. More like, I can't even begin to wrap my head around the words that you just said. I came directly to her, but then I saw she'd gone blind. And I realized it was my fault. I couldn't just step back into her life after what I'd done to her. Oh, come on now. She needs you more than she needs six new eyes. That's what I hoped. But I had to be sure, you see. And so I adopted the disguise. This way I could be near her without anyone knowing. I don't even want to unpack that. That's just dumb. I wish I had something more articulate to say, but I think this movie has robbed me of 90% of my brain cells. Cricket is also so angry about this whole thing, and I don't understand why. The most wonderful man in the world had asked her to be his wife. Those were her very words. Ooh, you, 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 you nincompoop! Paying any attention to the words of a gushing female. Oh, joy. Now it is also sexist. Finally, we get the reunion of these two lovebirds, and it's framed so wonderfully and cinematically because all we get to see is their hands. I know it was the 60s and animation was difficult because it was all hand-drawn, but this just feels supremely lazy. It kind of feels like the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail where the animator has a heart attack and the monster vanishes, but in this situation, the animator just quit or fell asleep. And they're like, we don't want to get rid of this love reunion scene. So they just dubbed over his hand drawings. After that, we get a reprise of the dad song, but now sung by Edward. And the only real purpose of it is to show that they got married. All I have to say about this song is something is wrong with that Jesus. We're in the home stretch now, I promise. So it's Christmas day and Tackleton comes in outraged at being left at the altar. There I was waiting at the church. What's this? What's this? What's going on here anyway? This just isn't fair. After all I've done for you. Tackleton has a complete meltdown because he's an incel and thinks he's entitled to Bertha because he made her dad work for nothing and gave them food scraps. What a prick. Oh, well, I guess he did give them five shillings. That makes up for it. Bertha then takes it upon herself to console him when he starts self-flagellating. Nobody loves me. But we all love you. And there will always be a place in my heart for a fine and kind and noble and handsome gentleman such as you. I know that Dickens is trying to squeeze as much of a Christmas carol in here, but I personally don't think Tackleton deserves to be redeemed. He was a dick the whole time, and then because he didn't get the arranged marriage he wanted, now we pity him. It just doesn't seem right to me. So then we get a 1,000 times speed run of a Christmas carol because getting complimented once turns Tackleton into a completely different man. I feel good all over. Nobody ever said such nice things to me before. <laughs> I feel as light as a lark, happy as a hummingbird. Why? Why? I wonder why. Maybe because it's Christmas. It really is Christmas. But of course. <laughs> and he doesn't care or even clock that Cricket's back and still alive and that his crow is dead, but who cares? It's Christmas! Oh, Cricket, you're the luckiest thing that ever happened to anyone. And that's it! Well, first we get another round of Cricket on the hearth and then old man Cricket comes back because he's the narrator and then Danny Thomas goes through the cast list and then that's it! Hooray! <laughs> Making this video took years off my life. So remember to subscribe! In actuality though, thank you to all the new people who have subscribed to my channel. I'm very glad that you enjoy whatever the hell my content is, and I hope you continue to enjoy it even when I go off the rails. So keep up the liking, keep up the subscribing, keep up the viewing. I don't have a third arm, just pretend my foot is a thumbs up. <laughs> Let me know if you want to see more videos like this. I watch a lot of commentary YouTubers and I've just always wanted to try it out and I think I found a movie that warranted a commentary video. But yeah, let me know if you like it or if you hate it or if you want to see specific things. I am beholden to you. I'm gonna go take a nap because I have mono. Bye. For Christmas.